Hello and welcome to the 94th Annual World Trade Week Conference. My name is David Ona with ABC7 Eyewitness News. Thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure to be here as well. In my work, I've traveled around the world and spoken to our neighbors here at home. One consistent theme I've noticed is that although we are often apart, we're all connected, which makes this event so incredibly important. And while we may not be physically together like in years past, I'm excited to see you all online. Again, thank you for joining us. For over 90 years, the LA Area Chamber's World Trade Week has been the most extensive and unique program of its kind. World Trade Week's legacy of promoting the benefits of global trade highlights how vital trade is to a strong local and national economy. As our communities are looking towards economic recovery, we know that global trade will play an important role. So before we begin our programming, I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors. Without their dedication to the industry and their generosity, today's program, the scholarships, the yearly educational programs would not have been made possible. Their involvement is integral in the success of the World Trade Week Southern California Initiative. So please, let's take a moment to recognize some of our sponsors. First of all, our platinum sponsor, FedEx Logistics. Thank you, FedEx Logistics. Our gold sponsors, Alba Wheels Up International, Consulate General of Mexico, California State University Northridge, HSBC, Los Angeles World Airports, NBC Universal, Ontario International Airport, Port of Los Angeles, Port of Long Beach, World City, Houston Terminals. And now our silver sponsors, Bank of America, California Community Colleges, Comerica Bank, Consulate General of Canada, Kroll and Mooring, Fast Track Global Service Inc., Karma Automotive, Los Angeles Regional Export Council, Maximus, U.S. Commercial Service. And you can find a full listing of our sponsors and partners on the conference main page. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Now, the uh, Los Angeles region is a gateway to the rest of the country and the world. Supply chains, they are critical in keeping our region's economy moving and thriving. This pandemic has highlighted the sector's crucial importance and the Los Angeles Area Chamber and the World Trade Week Committee thank all of the heroes that have remained committed to keeping supply chains moving. We can't say that enough. And we encourage you all to take a moment after the program to view the companies featured as heroes of logistics in this year's WTW Info Guide, which can be found under additional resources on the main event page. Now, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce an amazing leader that has taken the helm of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce less than two years ago. Through her leadership, the chamber has leaned in to provide assistance for businesses of all sizes to gain access to much needed help to weather through this current pandemic. The chamber has championed policies that support businesses and their path towards economic recovery, both at the local and global level. And the chamber has developed a strategic plan that not only reimagines the future of the chamber, but also the region with global engagement as one of its core pillars. Please join me in welcoming the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, Maria S. Salinas. Hello, I'm excited to be here with you today and to welcome you to the 94th Annual World Trade Week Conference. Although we have gone virtual this year, we have lined up an amazing event for you, and I'm excited that you have decided to join us. Throughout the economic and health crises affecting our communities, our businesses, and the global community, it has become even more apparent how interconnected our region is to the rest of the world. Our recovery, whether it's a V, U, or W-shaped recovery, will depend on all of us to ramp up trade, build jobs, and repair our economy. Throughout this dynamic time, I can't help but be inspired by the resilience of Southern California. It continues to be a region that leads in technology, education, and the global economy. 
Our innovation fuels the economic growth for the region as well as paving a path forward in our recovery. For more than 90 years, the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce and its World Trade Week Committee has focused on advancing the LA region as a global leader. Initially, World Trade Week was created to pr promote the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, but the Chamber has expanded its scope following World War II. And today, World Trade Week promotes all aspects of international trade that are so incredibly important to our local, regional, and national economy. Almost every business sector, no matter the size, can thrive beyond our borders. We understand the power of international trade and the potential opportunities that exist for businesses in Southern California. And we know that World Trade Week is one of our best examples of how local businesses can have a global impact. At the Chamber, we are committed to continuing our work with you, exporters, importers, foreign investors, and companies involved in international business. Our vision is to build a thriving region for all. A key component to make our vision a reality is global trade. We must advance Los Angeles's role as a powerful and dynamic region integral to the global economy. Our mission is to champion the investment, foreign and domestic, in innovation, trade, and infrastructure that enables regional businesses to succeed in the global economy. And we are proud to have each of you as partners in doing so. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. And thank you, Maria, and thank you for your leadership and your insight. I now have the honor to introduce a great partner to the Chamber. Through his leadership, he has advanced infrastructure and measures that support the most marginalized in our city. His office has been laser focused on addressing the homeless crisis, social inequity, and the pandemic. And we all know that the Olympics will be coming to Los Angeles in 2028 because of his leadership. His impact is felt across the city, nation, and around the world. His vision and exemplary service to Los Angeles is unmatched. So please join me in welcoming the 42nd Mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Eric Garcetti. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to LA's 94th annual World Trade Week. Los Angeles is that city where cultures collide, where identities intersect, and where the world comes to invent, innovate, and inspire. And though we're not gathered in person together as in past years, this week is still about tapping the very best of that spirit, because the mission of this week remains as important as ever, supporting and celebrating our international trade community right here in Los Angeles. I know this has been a period of great challenge for so many, Sectors are already finding it near impossible to navigate the shifting tides of Washington's unpredictable trade policies are now left dazed and adrift by this pandemic. And businesses that were sailing in the choppy waters of reckless trade wars are now simply trying to stay afloat. Here in Los Angeles, we don't sugarcoat reality. There's no doubt we are hurting, and we are anxious, but we are not powerless. Our city is resourceful and resilient. We are creative and capable. We are strong and made even stronger by our relationship with cities and countries and economies across the globe. And we know we are better off when we remain open and engaged with the world, not walled off from it. So in this moment of upheaval, we're harnessing the power of those partnerships to emerge even more resilient and more competitive, more connected and more prosperous than ever before. LA's international trade assets have been critical to our COVID-19 response, and they will remain essential to our economic recovery. For proof, look no further than the Port of Los Angeles, one of our great outlets to the rest of the globe. In the earliest days of this crisis, I directed the port's extremely successful and great executive director, Gene Soroka, to stand up Love LA, or Logistics Victory Los Angeles, by looking in our backyard and across oceans to find critical supplies to healthcare and other essential workers throughout the region. 
And as Angelinos adapt to the challenges at hand, the city of LA is expanding our export support for small businesses, including through the Port of LA's Trade Connect program and the city's business source centers. You see, here in our city, we know that working across borders and oceans and continents do more to help us recover from this crisis. And as always, our engagement can help grow our economies, expand our opportunities, and reimagine what our cities will be. Maria Salinas, who has provided steady leadership during this volatile moment, been a light guiding our city towards a more global future. Cindy Allen, who provided the virtual vision for this year's World Trade Week, and Vince Iacopella, who deserves special recognition as this year's recipient of the Stanley T. Olufsen Award. This time has tried and tested all of us, and I could not be more grateful to this community for your tenacity, your agility, and your extraordinary leadership. Thank you for all you do. And our thanks go out to Mayor Eric Garcetti for your vision, your dedication to this region. It is now my pleasure to introduce the World Trade Week Chair for 2020. As a noted leader in the sector, she has been active in the international trade industry for 30 years and has held various positions in the areas of import and export operations, consulting, and compliance and automation. She is also responsible for advocating for logistics and international trade to governmental agencies and authorities around the world. In her current role as the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Compliance at FedEx Logistics, she is responsible for overseeing the company's compliance with all current laws and regulations that govern operations everywhere FedEx Logistics does business globally. Please welcome Cindy Allen. Hello. I'm honored and privileged to be able to welcome you as the chair of the 94th Annual World Trade Week Southern California Conference, which is virtual for the first time. I want to begin by recognizing someone very dear to me, a friend and a colleague that many of you know, an impressive and very active member of our community, Wayne Wagner. Wayne was a friend to me and a very large presence in California. He was known for his contagious smile and his broad bellowing laugh. He was announced as this year chair and after unexpectedly passing away last summer, I was asked to serve as chair in his honor. Wayne was deeply passionate about global trade and the community outreach in California. He was a wonderful human being and warm and welcoming, even in the toughest of times. On many occasions, I tried to convince Wayne to move to Memphis to work with me directly. He was in operations in California and he always referred to MEM, which is our airport code for Memphis, as a marriage ending move. At a past trade event in California, I approached the subject with Wayne and his lovely wife, Lorita. She surprised us both by saying that she would be open to that. Wayne looked like he had just gotten caught taking a cookie that he wasn't supposed to have. The truth is he loved California and he loved being in the middle of an international trade market. He had made great friends and contacts here, both in the business and in the community. I always knew he would never leave, but it was really fun to tease him about it after that. In a region known for innovation and developing new ideas and processes and leading the industry, Wayne stood out among everyone. The coronavirus pandemic has affected every aspect of our industry. How we manage our teams are different, how we forge relationships with clients, suppliers, and colleagues is different. How we do business every day is different. And we've challenged in all business aspects, but it's been unprecedented how it's affected the international trade community. It's critical that we work together to overcome these challenges in order to continue to work to ensure the vital movement of the personal protective equipment and really those everyday necessities that we've all rely on to live in our everyday world. These current events have brought our industry to the front page. What we do isn't necessarily new. It's only become much more visible. My 78 year old mother now understands the complexities in getting goods to market. That's because I've arranged delivery of everything from groceries to medicines to her door so she can stay safe. And my kids no longer believe that I just answer email and talk on the phone for business. 
but know that me and my colleagues are really solving complex regulatory challenges so that they can have all of the equipment that they need to be successful in their lives. It's become personal now because of e-commerce and it's been impacted because of the virus. We want and we expect reasonably priced products delivered to our doors as quickly and cost efficient as possible. Shoppers now understand that those everyday items are going through a complex customs process and a complex transportation system more so than they ever could have imagined. The Los Angeles region in particular is critical to those processes and systems. It is the nation's largest metropolitan export market and continues to be one of the largest recipients of foreign direct investment. The innovative character of this region has been and continues to be powerful magnet for both global traders and investors. The innovation direction is more critical now than ever when everything is anything but normal. But we're in this together. We're here today in our actions and in our spirit. Together we will continue to move things forward as a community and as an industry addressing the critical needs for everyone around the globe. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the World Trade Week program. And Cindy, thank you so much for your dedication and your tremendous leadership. I want to remind you all that there is an exciting silent auction that's happening right now. All of the bidding is being hosted online and you can participate from your home uh, or your phone or computer and I invite you to take a look at the wonderful travel packages, including trips to Japan, Mexico, Europe, the Caribbean, Hawaii. There's wine trips, uh, a trip to the zoo, and so much more. And a portion of the proceeds from the auction will benefit World Trade Week's year-round activities and educational programs. So please bid on as many items as you would like, and please bid high. All the proceeds go to support the future of our industry and the World Trade Week Initiative. To visit the silent auction, you could simply go back to the main event page and scroll down to the additional resources section to be directed to the online auction. Good luck and have fun with it. So Los Angeles is truly a global city with more than 100 consulates, generals, and trade offices. And this makes Southern California the third largest home to diplomats and consular corps in the United States after Washington, D.C., and New York City. So I would like to take a moment to recognize all of the countries being represented by consul generals and trade officers or officers who are joining us today. And by the way, if you are representing one of these countries today, please drop a greeting in the chat box. Take a look. Some wonderful representation there. So I would like to acknowledge some important guests as well. Uh, World Trade Week Vice Chair and CEO of Ontario International Airport, Mark Thorpe. Also, Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles for International Affairs, Ambassador Nina Haichigian. CEO of Los Angeles World Airport, Justin Urbachi. Vice President of the Board of LA Airport Commissioners, Commissioner Valeria Velasco. Former U.S. Ambassador to Uruguay, Ambassador Frank Baxter. Thank you all for joining us. We're honored to have you. Now, throughout the long history of World Trade Week, education has been a key cornerstone of the program. So each year, the World Trade Week Education Committee seeks to engage the next generation of global trade leaders. Their mission is increase awareness about the various career opportunities within international trade industries. Last week, we celebrated 16 exceptional young men and women who are pursuing careers in global trade. A total of $12,000 in scholarships were distributed through the generous support of our sponsors. So we invite each of you to visit the Chamber's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Los Angeles Chamber to view the celebration and hear from the student scholarship winners. The direct link can be found on the main page event under resources. Congratulations to our scholarship winners, and it doesn't stop there. Each year, the World Trade Week's uh, Awards Committee selects companies and organizations 
in various categories to recognize their contribution to the international trade community. Please join me in watching the following segment as we congratulate and feature the companies receiving both the Export Achievement and the Bob Kleist Leadership Award and the Exceptional Scholarship Students. This will be followed by the presentation of one of the Chamber's oldest and most prestigious awards, the Stanley T. Olofsson Bronze Plaque Award. Take a look. My name is Jennifer Lee, president and co-founder of Nova Tech Nutraceutical. I'm Gary Mendel, president of Meridian Finance Group. I would like to start by thanking the LHM of Commerce for its initiative, trying to um, recognize export from local companies. My name is Angel Sanchez. I'm the director of global operations for Phoenix Technology Inc. of Riverside, California. Hello, my name is Stephen Armstrong. Hi, I'm Robert Kelly. And together with Robert Kelly, we co-founded Maple Business Council in 2015. My name is Serena Allen, and I attend the Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. My name is Ely Kenny Chang. I'm in a dual master's program at Claremont Graduate University. My name is Maria Espinoza, and I attend UC Berkeley. My name is Justin Fornes. I will attend the University of Chicago. My name is Margo Jurassic, and I attend the University of Southern California. Hi, my name is Tati Henderson, and I attend San Jose State University. My name is Melody Hines, and I attend University of California, Santa Barbara. Hi, my name is Kwan Lee, and I attend the University of Southern California. My name is Amanda Megan, and I'm a rising senior at Loyola Marymount University. My name is Joelle Men. I attend Claremont McKenna College. I'm Marie Phillips, and I attend the University of Southern California. My name is Ella Player. I will be attending UCLA. This is Aramis Rosa, and I will be attending the University of Southern California. My name is Kimia Saunders, and I am a 2020 World Trade Week Scholarship recipient. My name is Francis Rovillo, and I graduated as valedictorian for Carson Senior High School, class of 2020. My name is Marie Zaragoza, and I'm a junior at the University of Southern California. Hello, and good morning. It is my great pleasure to be with you today, and I am honored to present the Stanley T. Olofsson Award. Originally presented by the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce in 1936, this award is one of the Chamber's oldest and most prestigious awards. Since its inception, the Stanley T. Olofsson Award has been presented to a member of the international trade community whose outstanding dedication, efforts, and achievements in the field have advanced trade in the Southern California region. Olofsson showed tremendous foresight to organize the very first World Trade Week back in 1926. It created community awareness about the important our roles and harbors play in our national economy. And in 1976, the chairman of World Trade Week proposed naming the then Foreign Trade Week Award after Stanley Olofsson in commemoration of the creator of World Trade Week. I would like to take a moment to recognize the past recipients of this great honor, some of whom are celebrating here with us today. This year, we have the distinct honor of recognizing yet another trailblazer in our industries whose outstanding dedication and impact cannot be denied. Vince Iacopella, Executive Vice President of Growth and Strategy at Alba Wheels Up International is the winner of this year's Stanley T. Olofsson Award. Vince is a true leader in the global trade community and has worked in the LA market for over 30 years. He has served on numerous national advisory committees, including the Commercial Operations of Customs and Border Protection, better known as COAC. Vince has held leadership roles with the Los Angeles Customs Brokers and Forwarders Association, 
the Pacific Coast Council of Customs, Brokers, and Freight Forwarders, and the District Export Council of Southern California. Also, as a varied valued member of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce Board, Vince provides very valuable input, helping to guide our global programs. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Vince Iacopella. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to all of you that are in our virtual hall. Uh, I'm humble and grateful uh, for having been considered and awarded uh, the Olufsen Award. Uh, the Olufsen Award is such a huge part of LA global trade history, and to be part of that is just really, really, truly an honor uh, to be part of it. Um, when I received the award by FedEx at my house, um, I was reminded uh, just how different everything is in these unprecedented times. So with COVID-19, uh, my thoughts are with those that are experiencing economic hardship or have personal losses um, at this time. Uh, it, it's, it's truly an uh, unprecedented situation that we're in. Having said that, um, we need to keep ourselves safe, keep our families safe, seek out opportunities for our companies, and seek out opportunities for our employees. Um, you know, in 1987, I was 21 years old. I uh, was born and raised in New York. Um, I left a very close-knit uh, New York family to come to LA and work on a project for one or two years. Uh, here I am uh, 32 years later, and my mother still calls me, asking me when I'm moving back to New York. Um, I remember when I got to LA, um, the opportunity uh, in Los Angeles in the late 80s was really, um, uh, you could feel it immediately as you came to LA. Um, uh, Asian markets were opening to California exporters. Uh, global production was, was shifting a bit from Europe to Asia. And this was perfectly positioning Los Angeles to be uh, the global trade leader uh, that it, it is today. And having uh, grown up in that market was just truly uh, a privilege and an opportunity uh, for me. Um, in March 2020 of this year, uh, I think we all saw how uh, local events can have such a global impact and just how interconnected we are globally uh, through supply chain, through global trade, through air travel, technology. Um, we saw the risks of being so close uh, in our homes, in our companies, in our communities, uh, in our customers, our vendors, our families, uh, all saw this risk. And uh, we all need to work together uh, to mitigate these types of risks. But weeks later, we saw something else as well. We saw that this same global network, uh, the same global supply chain, and all of the stakeholders in the supply chain, customs brokers, forwarders, airlines, third parties, um, in a very agile way, activated their global supply chain to bring personal protection equipment to where it was available to where it was needed under very challenging circumstances. Well, we saw this uh, in our own company as well. In the past, we've talked about the need to bring people in to global trade. Uh, how if you're not in the global trade business, you don't really understand how global trade touches your life, or worse, there is a whole segment of, of folks out there that uh, feel left out of the success of global trade. So I believe that uh, we, although we've spoken in the past on how important it is in the past, now more than ever, it's important to bring people into global trade, educate them about global trade, uh, train them to participate in global trade, and make them competitive in a global economy. Um, and I believe that uh, we all can, uh, will be successful in stepping up to that challenge if we are uh, real clear-eyed about the challenges and work hard on the solutions. Um, for, sit, lastly, I would like to uh, thank um, my good friend, World Trade Chair Cindy Allen, uh, Jasmine Gonzalez, uh, President Maria Salinas of the Chamber. Uh, I owe a ton to the LA Customs Brokers, uh, the Pacific Coast Council of Customs Brokers, the District Export Council of Southern California, 
uh, my company, Alba Wheels Up, and the ownership, Damien and Sal Style, uh, for making global external engagement such a huge part of my job. Uh, my partner at home, Mark Leonard, uh, without whom I would not be standing here with this award at all. And uh, lastly, my hero in life, Joseph Icapella, uh, my father. Um, so I just thank you so much for this honor and award that was not expected uh, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you, Vince, for your dedication and passion for the industry and to our region. Loved your speech. Next, we have an insightful keynote address with Kimberly Reed, recognized as one of the 100 women leaders in STEM and Washingtonians most powerful women in Washington. Ms. Reed was sworn in as president and chairman of the board of directors of the Export Import Bank of the United States last May. She is the first woman to lead the organization which is an independent federal agency that supports nearly 1.5 million jobs in all 50 states over the past by facilitating the export of U.S. goods and services. Reed has spent her 20 plus year career working in the public and private sectors and has led efforts focused on American job creation, trade, economic development, food and agriculture and government reform. Please join me in welcoming Kimberly Reed. I join you virtually today from my office at the Export Import Bank, or EXIM, e -X -I -M, on the northeast corner of Lafayette Park overlooking the White House. This agency was established in 1934 and it is my honor to serve as the first woman president and chairman of the board of directors of EXIM. You will see behind me on the walls of this historic office knotty pine paneling, which as the first West Virginian to lead this agency in its 86 year history has a very special meaning to me. We all continue to contend with the COVID-19 global pandemic, but Americans are not going to fail in returning to greatness, health, and peace of mind. Banishing fear today means reopening together safely and effectively the greatest economy the world has ever seen an economy the American people built thanks to President Trump's policies of cutting taxes, reining in regulation, and standing up for American workers. But to return to that greatness, we must fearlessly use all of the tools we have available. One of the most important tools is export finance. This is where my agency comes in. XM fills gaps in private export finance to bolster U.S. job growth. XM does this through trade financing solutions such as export credit insurance, working capital guarantees, and guarantees of commercial loans to foreign buyers, all of it to empower the exporters of U.S. goods and services. On July 20th of this year, we celebrated the 51st anniversary of the historic moon landing. I felt that same sense of American innovation and purpose when, at Andrews Air Force Base on December 20th, 2019, President Trump established the United States Space Force, and later on that night on Air Force One, he signed into law Exxon's historic reauthorization. Thanks to the President's leadership and bipartisan support in the United States Congress, Exxon was reauthorized for the longest period ever, seven years. This gives us needed certainty to U.S. businesses and stakeholders, as well as to the world. I love that California state motto, Eureka. Let's think about that as we also think about Exim's new vision. Keeping America strong, empowering U.S. businesses and workers to compete globally. As we reopen our economy, many businesses of all sizes throughout Los Angeles County, including women-owned, minority-owned, and veteran-owned businesses, are considering accessing the global marketplace so they can find new customers and grow. After all, 95% of consumers are outside of our borders. In California, over the last five years, Exim has supported 603 exporters. Of these, 480 are small businesses, 100 are minority owned, and 84 are women owned. This support totals approximately $10 billion in total export value. The top destinations of Exim supported exports from California are to Mexico, Hong Kong, and the United Kingdom. 
In addition to supporting our nation's great small businesses, Exxon Board of Directors also recently approved one of the largest transactions in Exxon's history, a $4.7 billion transaction to assist the construction of a liquefied natural gas project in Mozambique. This project involves 68 U.S. suppliers supporting 16,700 American jobs across the country. Follow-on sales are expected to support thousands of additional jobs across the United States. And this transaction is significant not only because of its historic size, the U.S. job supported, and the potential of economic freedom for the people of Mozambique, but also because Exim's involvement helped displace Chinese and Russian financing from the deal. Speaking of China, that country has changed the nature of global competition over the past years with a premeditated strategy of aggressive official export financing. It totaled at least $76 billion in 2019, dwarfing any other country. Its official and medium long-term export credit activity was roughly equal to that of all G7 countries combined for the second year in a row. China has been the catalyst for most major export credit agencies becoming more proactive. There were 85 export credit agencies four years ago. Now there are 115, a striking 35% increase over the past four years. In June, I was pleased to submit Exim's report to the United States Congress on global export credit competition. This report underscores the magnitude of Chinese state-backed unfair competition which undermines our exporters and even puts America at a disadvantage in key sectors critical for our long-term economic and national security. Fortunately, our nation is taking a competitive approach to these and other challenges poised by Beijing, as outlined in the United States Strategic Approach to the People's Republic of China, released in May. Over the last few years, this administration has pursued a comprehensive, whole-of-government approach to helping the U.S. maintain technological dominance over its geopolitical competitors, particularly China. Secretary of State Pompeo, Attorney General Barr, National Security Advisor and my great friend Robert O'Brien, and FBI Director Chris Wray recently delivered a series of remarks explaining the different facets of America's relationship with China. Exim's December 20, 2019 reauthorization by Congress directed that Exim establish a new program on China and transformational exports, one of the most significant initiatives in Exim's history. Its purpose is to support the extension of loans, guarantees, and insurance at rates and on terms and other conditions fully competitive with the rates, terms, and other conditions established by the People's Republic of China. XM's China program will enable us to be a bold and innovative partner when our great U.S. company seeking to compete against China all around the world needs support and private financing is not available. This law charges XM with the goal of reserving at least $27 billion for the program and with advancing the comparative leadership of the United States with respect to China and supporting the United States innovation, employment, and technological standards through direct exports in key industries, many of which are very important also to Los Angeles and California, including 5G, FinTech, renewable energy, biotech, AI, advanced computing, semiconductors, space technology, and biomedical sciences. And we recruited a senior leader from the Pentagon with tremendous international business experience in both the public and private sectors to serve as my counselor and lead for this program. Former House Speaker Newt Gingrich recently wrote that without XM, there is no practical, clear way to compete against the ever-expanding Chinese economic military machine. With this new program at XM, we are directly taking on China's opaque and exploitative model of economic development and finance while at the same time supporting American and Californian jobs. Over just the last few months, Exim has actively engaged important members of the nation's emerging technological industrial base to solicit their views on how Exim can be more helpful to them in supporting their exports abroad. This outreach, which included to companies and individuals in California, 
will hopefully begin new significant deal flow supporting U.S. jobs, but we, I, want to do more, a lot more, particularly deals supporting smaller but growing companies, which have been an exciting source of innovation around our country, not only in Silicon Valley in New York, but also in Los Angeles, small towns throughout California, and even in my home state of West Virginia, all of which are maintaining exciting emerging technology ecosystems that need to be supported. Why? Because the mission is that important. We are now on a pathway to a strategic bifurcation between the United States and China in the development and use of powerful foundational technologies around the world. Where those capabilities have been developed in the United States, we must support their export. With this in mind, the help that XM can provide to U.S. Tech technology innovators, specifically their desire to compete in the international marketplace, will be vitally important part of our overall national security strategy. This is what Congress wants us to do, and it's what the President wants us to do. In this mission, Exim must succeed. In the past, Exim has been needed most during periods of stress in global financial markets. This was the case following the 2008 financial crisis when Exim's authorizations increased 80%. When COVID-19 impacted our country and the world, Exim took swift action and we continue to respond to the U.S. and global financial disruptions and instabilities. At the outset of the crisis, Exim quickly mobilized as part of a whole of government approach to focus on economic recovery and health and safety. I am so proud of our 515 employees and contractors at XM for how, on a temporary basis, they transformed into a fully teleworking agency, putting health and safety first as they worked with American exporters to reduce the negative economic impacts of the pandemic, especially when it comes to U.S. jobs. So I just want to say what an immense honor it is to be part of the furthering this historic effort to support and advance America's prosperity. Exim is going to be serving California and American businesses of all sizes that seek to export. We are going to continue to support Los Angeles jobs and American jobs and help keep America strong for years to come. Thank you so much, Ms. Reed, and we really appreciate your insight. Wonderful speech. Now we have a fascinating panel discussion on a topic that is top of the mind across the industry sector and all facets of our lives. As COVID-19 has forced the transition to digital trade and e-commerce has been affected as well. So the management and protection of supply chains that rely on these digital systems face greater th threats than ever before. So we have the distinct pleasure of industry experts joining us on the panel to discuss the increasing dangers to international trade and investment from cyber threats and the need for greater security. Matthew Travis, he serves as the first deputy director for the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. As deputy director, he supports the CISA director in overseeing the Cybersecurity Division, the Infrastructure Security Division, the National Risk Management Center, and the Emergency Communications Division. His operational support responsibilities are to ensure a holistic approach to critical infrastructure protection across physical and cyber risk activities. Chris Hetner is Executive Vice President of Moody's Cyber Assessments, Inc., and serves as Special Advisor of Cyber Risk for the National Association of Corporate Directors. With over 25 years of experience in cybersecurity, risk management, and regulatory compliance, Chris served as the Senior Advisor to the United States Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman on Cybersecurity. Gene Soroka is the Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles, the busiest container port in North America. In March of 2020, he was named by Mayor Eric Garcetti as Chief Logistics Officer for the City of Los Angeles. And while maintaining his duties as the Port's Executive Director, Gene leads the Logistics Victory Los Angeles effort and has assembled a 20-member team to assist in getting critical health care and emergency supplies into the hands of those who need them the most. 
Under his direction, the port has taken a leadership role in adopting cutting-edge technologies to improve the reliability, predictability, and efficiency of the flow of cargo across global seaborne trade, including the launch of the digital information portal Port Optimizer. And Mario Cordero, a former World Trade Week chair and Stanley T. Olofsson honoree, serves as the executive director of the Port of Los Angeles, excuse me, the Port of Long Beach. Previously, uh, Mario served as a member, vice president, and president of the Long Beach Board of Harbor Commissions for eight years before accepting President Barack Obama's appointment to the Federal Maritime Commission in 2011. During his tenure as a Long Beach Harbor Commissioner, Mr. Cordero spearheaded the development of the pioneering Green Port Policy, which outlines a sustainable environmental ethic for all port operations, mandating that trade growth must run parallel with environmental stewardness. Moderating the discussion, we are honored to have General Linda Medler with us this morning. As a retired Brigadier General with a 27-year career in the U.S. Air Force, General Medler is founder, president, and CEO of L.A. Medler & Associates. Her company provides cyber strategy and operational consulting services to commercial clients, including for-profit and non-profit boards, Department of Defense contractors, and private equity firms. Prior, she served as the Chief Information Security Officer and Director of IT Security at Raytheon Missile Systems, where uh, she was responsible for cybersecurity services and governance relating to the security and risk mitigation of unclassified information, computer systems, data, and networks. The panelists will take live questions at the end, so please submit your questions in your chat box right here. General Medlin, the program is yours. Thank you so much, David. Um, and given our time limitations, we're just going to jump right in. Um, as an independent director myself, I know firsthand that cyber resiliency is top of mind across boardrooms, not only in the United States, but of course internationally. Um, yet at the same time as the theme of this panel suggests, the U.S. must maintain a safe and sustainable global trading environment. And today, more than ever, the trade ecosystem is reliant on technology, and with this reliance comes increased cyber risk. So with that in mind, I'd like to direct my first question to Matt. Um, how does the Department of Homeland Security, and in particular, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, define the U.S. trade ecosystem from a critical infrastructure perspective? Matt? Hey, thanks, General. And first off, thanks, everyone, for the invitation to World Travel Week and the uh, L.A. Chamber of Commerce. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Mm. Uh, real quick, in case some of you of the audience may not be familiar with uh, CISA, I think we're still the newest government agency in, in the federal government created uh, not quite two years ago. And we exist to work with those owners and operators across 16 sectors of critical infrastructure, as well as uh, the federal executive branch, the, the .gov, if you will, and state, local, tribal, territorial jurisdictions across the country to uh, protect infrastructure and reduce the risk to it from both physical and electronic attacks. So we have easily have the cybersecurity mission, but we also have uh, the mission to protect infrastructure against natural hazards. And when you talk about our adversaries uh, on the cyber side, we're really talking about the big four nation state, those those threat actors of China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and then the, the global cyber criminal syndicates as well. And so at CISA, we, we think about ecosystems, and it's a great word to use because it certainly is. We look through everything through a security lens. So to us, it's that, that global infrastructure and ecosystem is truly that because of international trade, uh, communications, the globalization of, of the planet, and before COVID when we're all traveling on airplanes, that has necessitated a collective approach to security, meaning because of all the interdependencies, what's your risk is my risk. I'm talking about from private sector to uh, the government sector, but also from country to country. And so it really does uh, mandate a collective approach. And so in that, through that lens of security, the ecosystem in terms of U.S. trade for us is one in which uh, we see a lot of vulnerabilities and probably the biggest priority for us that defines how we look at it is supply chain risk and, and it's our efforts in uh, supply chain risk management, meaning uh, how industry can ensure that the systems and the components, the technologies 
that they're building in place to whether it's manufacturing, whether it's transportation systems, whatever the industry, whatever the sector, uh, that we have some uh, or more than some uh, reliability and, and integrity that those components uh, are not exposing vulnerabilities, meaning that we understand where those, uh, those components come from, that we understand uh, that they are not uh, implanted with uh, malicious devices, malicious code, uh, bugs and other vulnerabilities. And that is a, that is a hard problem set. And so most of our efforts uh, in, in the ecosystem is to work with industry. Uh, we, we lead in the, in here in Washington, uh, the uh, ICT Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force. That's the information and com, uh, computers technology sector. So we got about 40 companies as well as about 20 federal partners. And, and we're currently in the midst of trying to better understand where the risk resides in terms of supply chain risk and more importantly, uh, figuring out what we're going to do about it. Terrific. Thank you so much, Matt. So um, given that broad view of critical infrastructure, Chris, I'd like to direct the next question to you. What are the international implications and how do we coordinate across our international borders? Yeah, thank you, Linda, and thank you for, uh, for having me speak on this uh, important topic. Um, you know, I'll, I'll date myself a bit. Uh, I've been in the cybersecurity arena for just about 28 years. And I recall as an undergraduate student at John Jay College Criminal Justice in the City University of New York, he had this nutty professor and he said, Chris, the bad guys are going to go from robbing banks with guns to executing complex code over computer networks. And that resonated with me in, in my search for a career in not only you know, protecting systems and protecting companies and, and, and the like, but also thinking about how the adversarial perspective would advance that cause. So um, fast forward to today, you know, this is a, a real problem for you know, national security matters, uh, all the way down to the mom and pop shops, to uh, various uh, types of companies. And if we think about the international implications, Linda, you know, it's really all about interconnectedness uh, through the supply chain and dependencies. Um, there's also underlying processes from a business perspective. There are commerce implications, and obviously there are technological implications through interconnected, you know, hardware systems, applications to support the functioning of that international trade system. So as you start to, you know, overlay technology, complex processes with this, you know, global uh, ecosystem, uh, you start to introduce uh, the furtherance of vulnerabilities. And just by way of example, in, in June 2017, uh, Maersk, uh, which is a you know, global uh, shipping company, uh, represents roughly 15% of global trade containers being shipped worldwide, uh, was disruptive and, and victim to a cyber attack named NotPetya. And uh, it's a malware type of attack, uh, ransomware that's causing disruption, and we've seen the increase of disruption. But at the end of the day, uh, it caused uh, a two-week shutdown of Maersk. Uh, it cost them $300 million and had a ripple effect across the supply chain. It also impacted a number of other organizations. So you come to the realization that uh, this is all about you know, dollars and cents, euros and francs, economic impact. And we have to shift more towards a business-oriented lens on the implications associated with cyber to the extent that we continue to rely on these complex processes and, and technological platforms to support our, our business functioning and certainly the functionality of international trade. One more statistic that is uh, quite um, you know, kind of you know, frightening and kind of places you at the edge of your chair uh, through the economic uh, World Economic Forum projects uh, by 2021, uh, roughly $6 trillion in economic losses globally as a result of cyber. Um, so this is a real problem set, and we need to truly elevate the problem set to the board, uh, to senior management, to policymakers to ensure that it truly resonates with them and we're creating some consistency around you know, how we coordinate on these broad-based international implications. 
Wow, thanks so much, Chris. Um, now I'd like to turn our discussion to two questions that I think organizations worldwide uh, are grappling with on a daily basis. So um, first, what are the cyber threats we see across the trade community? And secondly, what are the potential economic implications if cyber attacks are realized? So maybe Jean, um, you could go first and then uh, we'll, uh, when you're finished, we'll turn it over to Mario and you all both can provide your perspective on these two uh, critical questions. Jean? Great, thanks, General. I think the threats in the supply chain can really be categorized into three areas. One, the operational threats on the physical movement of cargo and goods. We're all becoming increasingly reliant on digitization, and with that, vulnerabilities open up. Uh, port operations are no different, and being at the confluence of all these activities, on surface transportation, air-related routes, and others makes us uniquely impacted. But it's not time to hide. It's time to accelerate our capabilities because these areas of vulnerability may also include public safety and the folks that rely on each other through interagency responsibilities, and the capability of protecting what's on the ground from an asset base, as well as our folks and the staff and crews that are on these. Oh, I think we may have lost him. Um, so Mario, do you wanna, you wanna pick that up? Sure, um, thank you General for this opportunity to comment on this very important uh, subject matter, not only uh, for the country, but for the global community. As we are aware, uh, this is a, an issue of a global conversation. You know, just to give some context to the question here, I think uh, reference has al already been made with regard to the MERS incident in June of 2017, uh, how potentially it could impact this industry. And to give you some perspective, you know, for the Port of Long Beach, uh, this is a very, very high priority for us with regard to addressing this issue and having the appropriate firewalls uh, put in place, state-of-the-art firewalls to put in place uh, to uh, address this question given where we're at today. So as an example, in August alone, this past August, there were 370 million hits uh, with regard to the Port of Long Beach attacks. Uh, and again, these figures, I would venture to say that every port in major port in the global community probably has comparable figures. Uh, that, that number was a approximately a 42% increase from the prior month. So to date, for the year 2020, we have approximately a number of 1.5 billion hits. Uh, so it tells you the magnitude of where we're at today with regard to the, uh, uh, the cybersecurity question. Uh, so in terms of the, the uh, trade community and the impacts. I think obviously uh, we're concerned as a industry of the global uh, impact, or excuse me, as the industry impacts to the operations. I think that's what Gene was commenting on. And of course, the economic impact as a result of that, I think as a gateway, we're very uh, proud to say the direct, the, the direct and indirect jobs that come from this history, uh, industry, the, this gateway, uh, at the tune of, again, at least for the Port of Long Beach itself, 55,000 runs in regard to the city of Long Beach uh, regionally, 500,000 plus jobs at the state level, 700,000 plus jobs direct or indirect as a result of this operation. And of course, in the national supply chain, that number is like 2.6 million. So when you talk about a cyber issue, it's not only an issue with regard to that can cause disruption, it also could cause the impact on the supply chain which then results on an economic impact, not only with regard to the goods movement, but also with regard to the impact potentially on jobs in the supply chain. So I think uh, clearly suffice to say that this whole issue of cyber attacks is ubiquitous now with regard not only to the private sector, but to the public sector. Great, thank you. So if we could uh, keep with that um, thought and given the significant number of hits you uh, articulated, 
how are the ports then thinking about contingency plans in light of a, a large cyber event? Uh, Mario, could you speak on uh, your process and, and what you all do to be prepared for that? Well, I think this comes, comes under the subject matter of business continuity. Uh, again, I think every uh, organization, whether in the public or private sector, uh, this concept of business continuity is extremely important. Obviously, when we talk about cyber events, that's very much in the forefront in terms of how we prepare. Uh, I think coming into this position, coming from Washington, as uh, was referenced, uh, I think one of the key things that we did here immediately as a priority for me was cyber training for all our, our employees here at the port. It's a requirement. So uh, I think that uh, is very, very important because at the end of the day, there's a very high percentage of the fact that a successful attacks or hacks, a lot of it has to do with the human link to this uh, scenario. So it is very important here for us at the Port of Long Beach that every member in the personnel uh, here at the Port of Long Beach, we are periodically continuing with cybersecurity training. Uh, now, in addition to that, again, continuing the investment on state-of-the-art firewalls. And I think with that, I think these are some of the uh, priorities that we have here at the Port of Long Beach, including our collaborative approach with our tenants here, so that again, uh, we do the best we can with regard to what I've referenced, this ubiquitous approach to uh, cyber in terms of what that impact could be, not only to a port, but to the industry supply chain. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have Gene back. Um, so Gene, if I could uh, throw at, back to you and see if you wanted to finish up with your, your first thought or if you wanted to discuss how the ports are thinking about contingency plans in light of a, a large cyber event. In the cyber arena, uh, we have the saying that it's not a matter of if but when. So can you give us some idea of what you all are doing there? Sure. Thanks, General, and sorry for the disconnect. Uh, just to recap on the first question, um, all areas of port operations being that we're at the confluence of the surface and air transportation network are vulnerable, and that's where our focus has been, starting with the creation of a cybersecurity operations center, the first of its kind for a port in the United States, and having able folks manage that center who are ISO 27001 trained and educated. The further look takes us into what's possible for tomorrow, and that's a cyber resilience center. Working very closely with the allied agencies from the Coast Guard, United States Coast Guard, to the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI Secret Service, Interpol, and so many others on what resilience really means. Taking some examples from the energy sector, sharing information with a point of anonymity to make sure that commercially no one is disadvantaged is also part of what we're doing. This will be the first cyber resilience center of its kind in the world for a port infrastructure project. And the work that's being done to combine all of those folks, including the people who manage the business as well as those who work on the docks will be integral to its success moving forward. What we're doing to plan around the four corners of this port also starts with people and that continued training and education to manage these intricate systems. We can see the IP address of a threat coming from far reaching locations. In fact, pre COVID, we were stopping 20 million cyber intrusion attempts per month. Post COVID, that number has more than doubled. Folks are tracking down employees of all sorts, both public and private at home and trying to find vulnerabilities. And this is where we have to step up from the areas of people who are educated in this field to those, as Mario just said, that go to work every day, minding their own systems and being aware of what the bad guys could possibly do. Making sure that we are prepared, business continuity, continuity of operations plans and disaster recovery plans, including remote locations that are known only to a few to make sure that we can keep our business up and running as an economic engine of the country's trade are also directly in our line of sight. Back to you, General. 
Great, thank you so much. So I think one of the most important aspects of a panel such as this is actually to uh, provide some guidelines to organizations that are out there in our listening audience. Um, so Matt, could I ask you to discuss how the DHS classifies as critical risk and what guidelines maybe have been set for businesses? Absolutely, General. If I could, I just want to touch on one of the early questions on the threat landscape because we spent a pretty good amount of time looking at that. And just for the for the audience to put it in clear terms, those nation state adversaries or those more sophisticated uh, cyber criminals, they're looking to do a number of things. Either they're trying to steal our intellectual property, uh, they're trying to steal our money uh, through ransomware, uh, they're trying to spy on us, or they're trying to sabotage or jack up our critical infrastructure. Neither one of those outcomes is good. We can talk about which is the worst uh, you know, how to prioritize, but th that's what's really at stake. We talk about cyber threats and vulnerabilities. There are very tangible and uh, very real outcomes if when the, when the threat actors are successful. In terms of how we classify risk, uh, critical risk, it's not a term we still use, but I, I will talk about how we look at risk. We used to work with our partners and really still do through this, those 16 sectors of infrastructure that I talked about. But a couple of years ago, we realized that might be a good framework to have meetings and collaborate, but it was necessarily a good analytical framework. So we, uh, about a year ago, in working with industry, uh, released what we call National Critical Functions, or NCFs. And that's really how we look at risk, especially in a trade environment. And at NCFs, you think about what are those activities, what are those systems, what are those industries that, that drive our economy, that enable our security, that propel what we consider the American way of life? And what would happen if those functions went sideways, either through attack or a hurricane or what have you. And we're talking about things like the electrical grid, uh, the financial system, elections. Mm -hmm. uh, we've said there are 55 of them. Maybe there's more, maybe there's fewer. Uh, but what we're trying to do here at DHS is to work with industry and to, instead of just talking about the problem and having meetings, actually bring folks in and collaborate on understanding truly where the risk resides, meaning let's in any one sector, we can take the maritime trade sector, where does the risk reside? Where are the vulnerabilities? Uh, where are the interdependencies? So how does impacts in one sector affect uh, the maritime transportation sector? And then let's actually log those and map those and let's not just uh, you know talk about it. And then let's model the impacts if there's an attack on those. And ultimately where we want to get to is we understand where the risk is and if we can agree to that, what, what things can we do to lower that risk? Maybe it's new technologies, maybe it's new laws or authorities or, or new uh, treaties or sanctions, whatever that is, they re-engineer their process. Uh, but ultimately, where the government sees risk, if it's up here, and industry sees risk that may be lower, maybe it's the other way around, we want to close that gap. Because again, we're looking through a security lens. And so what we're trying to do is to, uh, is to help industry understand uh, where the risk is. And when you think about bad guys, uh, we want you know the FBI is out to chase the bad guys. Uh, the Pentagon's out, uh, the intelligence community is out to spy on the bad guys. We want to make sure that industry is better informed about the bad guys, more resilient against them, and better prepared. And so that's really how we look at critical risk. Terrific. Thank you so much. So, um, Chris, I'd like to turn it back to you. And frequently from the boardroom, uh, I know firsthand directors uh, continue to grapple with how to see cyber from a broader risk lens. Um, Matt talked about that uh, a little bit. So I'm wondering, how do we shift the focus from cyber risk from technology to discussing it from an overarching risk perspective? Um, and I like to think of it as people, processes, and technology. So could you give your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a great point, and, and to build upon you know Matt's perspective, you know from certainly from a DHS and you know macro perspective, you know, you're kind of looking at you know interconnectedness, nation states, various industry sectors, and distilling that down to various critical functions. Um, let's drill down the aperture a bit into the boardroom, into a company or an organization that is managing logistics within the trade ecosystem. And, you know, really uh, to reinforce uh, Matt's perspective, it's understanding, you know, what are those critical assets, critical business processes, and deriving at the intersection and the dependency between the two, because that informs all types of decision making around investment, around business continuity planning, around the types of adversarial perspective that can potentially impact those core systems and those core processes. And it helps you kind of whittle down 
this enormity of, of global cyber threat to something that's r truly relevant to not only your company, your mission, your organization, but also down to those specific processes and those specific systems. And look, you know, at the end of the day, you're not never going to be 100% secure. Um, if you if you were to tighten up every bolt, if you were to you know lasso in or or, or um, completely shut down the hatches across the organization, you wouldn't be profitable. You'd be un unproductive. So there's a degree of realizing that there's a level of risk acceptance, risk tolerance level, and in order to establish that level of risk exposure and and visibility, you've got to start with that deeper analysis on drawing out those correlations between technology platforms, core business processes, and what's the adversarial perspective on the exploitation of those perspectives. And now you've got a starting point to have some conversations with your CFO or your chief risk officer or with your board directors to say, hey, you know, we've got, you know, tens of millions of dollars in cyber exposure. If we don't make any investment, that's the exposure. Uh, through a business interruption event or through a data loss event, are we willing to accept that exposure? And that's ultimately the starting point in conversation with the board. You know, certainly through my past experience with the Securities and Exchange Commission, you know, we issued as, as an agency 2018 interpretive guidance on cyber disclosure across publicly traded companies within the United States. And the expectation there is that not only are you disclosing material matters in terms of risk and incidents to the shareholder community, but we're also driving that improved dialogue from management up into the boardroom in terms of quantifying that risk exposure. Now, fast forward to today, the work that I'm doing with Moody's and Team 8 and operating with the NACD community, we're shifting the dialogue now from what we call bits and bytes technical complexity to something that's more tangible and actionable from a business perspective, allowing that complexity to exist so you can pull those levers to make change, but also elevating it to a point where it's digestible, understandable by the non-technical community. And that's where I see there's a truly a disconnect there between you know, the technology exposure and creating something that's actionable by the board, by risk management, and ensuring that it's ingrained into the fabric of the organization. And that helps to inform decisions around what types of controls you may apply, what types of investments. If a business continuity plan uh, necessitates a $10 million budget relative to $100 million in exposure, you could start uh, performing that calculation, that analysis on what investment dollars should be placed in order to apply those seatbelts in the event that the, the incident does occur. And we all know that the incidents are occurring um, they're going to occur increased uh, capacity, increased intensity. The adversaries are even more desperate than ever, and they're going to start exploiting uh, those vulnerabilities. So I, I think it really comes down to the quantification and, and of the exposure and having that constructive dialogue with a deeper dive from an adversarial perspective. So I hope that helps. Yes, it, it is a constant battle in uh, the boardrooms to try and understand it from a broader business risk perspective um, and a company oversight perspective as a director than uh, rather from a tech technology perspective and that sometimes requires um, someone to be able to communicate both on the technology side as well as on the business side. So thanks for that, that insight. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and um, before we go to our Q&A and, and I already see that we've got some great questions coming in from the audience, um, but keeping with the idea of that, uh, I think a, the real value of a panel such as this is to give the audience a couple of takeaways that they can go back and, and do uh, to their organization to make their lives a little bit uh, better or provide more insight into this uh, very topical uh, idea of cyber risk and, and cyber security. So for each panelist, I'd like to ask you to uh, provide your thoughts on some best practices and takeaways. And Chris, since we finished with you, why don't we start with you on this one and then I'll call on each of the panels in line. So Chris, over to you to lead us off. Well, uh, I'll give you a real world example as a former chief information security officer for you know, $500 billion financial institution, 
day one, the first question I asked of management is where is our IT asset and business risk inventory? Um, and that's really the starting point. Uh, you can't protect what you don't know. So that could be a, a useful starting point is to inventory all your core technology assets aligned with core business processes and start performing a mapping exercise to ensure you have visibility in terms of what to protect. Terrific, thank you. Mario, how about, how about some of your thoughts on uh, maybe some best practices and takeaways for the audience? Well, first of all, I think, again, it's fair to say that uh, one needs to be proactive, and this is a multi-layered approach. I think there are three things that uh, at least a, a takeaway in terms of what uh, every organization needs to understand. Number one, prevention. The efforts that you place with regard to uh, the prevention component and investing in state-of-the-art technology. Number two, planning. Planning with regard to Again, not only with regard to moving forward in terms of how you move with uh, the cybersecurity awareness, but also under the concept of business continuity. You know, um, any disruption, you have to be prepared, uh, again, based on business continuity and those principles to make sure that you have an adequate plan to move forward and address immediately whatever incident may occur. And last, with regard to training, I think the investment in training, I think you've heard the uh, commentators speak today that, again, uh, that's very important to this dynamic. Again, when you look at the issue of uh, cybersecurity and some of the instances that we're aware of that uh, of hacks that are successful, a lot of times at a very high percentage really comes to uh, human error. And by that, I mean uh, people who, uh, again, uh, un uh, unintentionally open a link that they don't look twice at or an attachment. And again, you have to be very cognitive. Uh, some of the, uh, the practices that people have uh, in this uh, cyber attacking the kind of mode. So I think those are three areas that again are very important for any organization. You know, prevention, planning, and training. And last, I would say that again, going forward, you know, we've are experiencing now the uh, coming or what we're in the fourth industrial revolution, one of digital transformation. And of course, as we look ahead in the next decade, moving towards a fifth industrial revolution. So suffice to say that the best practices are ever more important at this point, because again, you know, technology is going to be something that continues to excel at a level that uh, we are not even predicting at this point. I think uh, last I will say there was a, a report from the um, World Global Forum which indicated that today, our children today will probably be in careers, 65% of them will probably be in careers that we don't even imagine today. And I think again, as we move forward, uh, these key practices are gonna be ever more important. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, Jean, what are your thoughts on uh, some best practices and, and advice for our audience? General, I think you hit it. People, process, and technology. And thinking about it as a fellow chamber member, many of our members are small to medium-sized businesses who may not have the access that we do. And it all starts with awareness. And we were coached up pretty early on. What would you do if your car didn't start? If you didn't have your cell phone and the apps that you used for banking? What would happen if your card key didn't work at the office? So that general awareness and the shock to the system is what gets everyone engaged. But I think for the general chamber membership, it's about putting services and thought leaders in front of you. And if you need assistance, if you want your company to succeed in this area, let's pull you together under the auspice of Maria Salinas and the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce to get that training and awareness out there so we can be supportive of our membership. 
Terrific. And I, I really liked your point also on uh, the criticality of information sharing um, from an autonomous perspective and, and how together we are more resilient than trying to divide and uh, conquer because uh, we all need to band together to create a more secure environment. So thank you for that. And Matt, uh, how about we finish up uh, this question with you and your thoughts on perhaps uh, for the audience, some best practices and and advice, as you see a lot from your seat. Sure, Joe, thanks. Uh, you know, we want everyone to make risk-informed decisions, and, and Chris really nailed it. You can't make a risk-informed decision if you don't know what assets you have, what you're trying to protect. And a lot of people think when it comes to information or computer-controlled functions, well, it's just all computer stuff. You really need to take an inventory and, and, and build your protection, your security regime around that. You know, the equivalent would be if you're just selling cheap Chinese uh, uh, you know, digital watches, you're probably not going to spend a lot of money to protect that store. But if you're selling Rolexes, you're probably going to have a, a watchman and security cameras, what have you. So think that in terms of digitally what the equivalent is in terms of building your security. Two, you got to train your people. Uh, I mean, it used to be that the worst thing an employee could do in a company is, you know, uh, trash the copier, spill coffee on a keyboard, or do something stupid at a holiday party. Now with one keystroke, an employee can completely ruin your entire network by answering uh, or clicking a link on a spear phishing email. So every person, every employee matters. And so you got to invest in training and awareness, as, uh, as Gene said. And then final partner, uh, there are resources out there. CISA is one of them. So CISA.gov, C-I-S-A. We have a lot of uh, free materials. Everything we do is free. Taxpayer, uh, we're, we're a government entity. And so we've got best practices. We've got training modules. Uh, avail yourself of resources that are out there. Terrific. Thanks so much. So we do have some questions that uh, have come in. And the first one, um, Matt, maybe I'll address to you, but I'd like uh, all of you to weigh in because I think it pertains to each, each of your areas. So the question is, in terms of public safety, how would you suggest a company focuses on public safety communications and reach out to potential partners? So it's, it's a great question, and I didn't really talk about that part of our organization, CISA. We actually are the federal lead for emergency communication and ensuring the interoperability of public safety communications. So first responders, uh, we work with all the governance bodies to make sure that not only does the equipment talk to each other, but uh, the first responders, state officials are, are trained on it. You won't know uh, how uh, you know how compromised you are in any type of instant response if you have not uh, ensure that your communications are reliable and interoperable. And so I think, uh, to an earlier point, this is really where the preparedness investment makes uh, makes it's of great consequence to, to ensure that, that those communication channels, the equipment that you're using, uh, is uh, is working and working with those people are going to be supporting you in any type of incident response. And it goes sort of towards uh, that planning and that um, practice. Uh, for your contingency plan. Absolutely. So, yeah. absolutely. So uh, Gene, uh, what are your thoughts on this question regarding public safety communications and outreach to partners? Yeah, this is right up our alley, General. And what I would suggest to the membership, and again, under the direction of Maria, that we could bring forward our uh, Port Police Chief, Tom Gazy, who is also the head of public safety, and demonstrate how we're intertwined with the other allied agencies that can help support the private sector businesses. Uh, so we'll make that, uh, that robust opportunity available to the membership. Great, thank you. Mario, any thoughts there? Well, sure. On this question, first of all, I'd like to thank the Department of Homeland Security that has placed such an effort in this area, which uh, translates into funding to the various ports here in the United States to address this issue. So, Matt, uh, thank you and, uh, and uh, for all that uh, uh, DHS does on this question. Uh, for the Port of Long Beach, we have the Joint Command and Control Center here, and as the people uh, are aware, this is a kind of a state-of-the-art uh, public safety um, infrastructure that we have here. It's a collaboration of FBI, local law enforcement, Coast Guard. Uh, and again, uh, this structure that we have uh, is one that, again, in terms of we address some of the public safety component to make sure that we have very, very good collaboration and communication with regard to the importance of this component here as it relates to the operation of the port complex. 
Chris, any, any thoughts on the public safety wearing your former head at the SEC and also when you were a part of a, a large financial institution? Probably that thought was pretty high in your priority list. Yeah, and, and really uh, it, it uh, distills itself down to having uh, a fairly comprehensive crisis management plan, uh, realizing that these events will occur, it's, it's inevitable. And you know, I've what I've seen uh, successfully executed across the financial services sector, you know, working on you know dozens of these types of exercises with various three-letter agencies and in, in government. Um, it's where cyber becomes nested into the broader crisis management plan because you realize that while the event may be cyber-driven, the downstream impact has broad-reach implications across operational impact you know, regulatory communications, public relations. So, you know, the chain from, you know, the cyber event downstream becomes fairly broad and, and this requires a broader set of constituents. So, you know, nesting that cyber plan as part of your crisis management plan, ensuring that you have local officials, whether it be local folks in DHS, um, you know, the, the local FBI agent, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that those folks are on call and then you know, having that relentless exercise process because you know these plans can become very stale very quickly and i can tell you uh, you know every time you conduct an exercise you're going to learn something new so relentless exercising building those cyber muscles continuous planning and continuous adjustment thank you um so Matt, I think uh, maybe you would be best positioned to answer this, but I know um, the other panelists uh, are seeing it from their lens as well. So the question is, where do most of the attacks come from? Are they primarily foreign or domestic threats? Um, so good luck with that one, Matt. <laughs> Uh, no, it's a, it's a great question. And before I answer it, let me just, I, I failed when I talked about all the resources that, that CISA provides. We actually have a national presence. We've got regional offices. We've got people in the field, whether they're cyber advisors, protective security advisors, emergency communication advisors. We can connect you with those if you contact, uh, go through the CISA.gov uh, website. But in terms of the threat, uh, there are a lot of uh, we call advanced persistent threats or APTs. Those come from, from nation states. As I said before, it's Iran, China, North Korea and Russia, they all kind of want different things. I mean, China's on an undeterred march to global data, data domination uh, you know, for two reasons, as I see it. One, to uh, you know, maintain the, their, their hold on power, which is why they want to uh, collect personal information, building global databases. Uh, it would make uh, you know, George Orwell look like the minor leagues in terms of uh, privacy intrusions and certain people's names, social security numbers. That's what the OPM does. You know, the Marriott breach, they weren't hacking Marriott to, to scoop up rewards points to, for weekends in Lauderdale. It, it is to, to build that uh, database of people. And then secondly, it's to dominate more, more appropriately, more acutely for this audience, it's to dominate those 10 industries that they have articulated they want to dominate globally by 2025. Built in China 2025 is the strategy, and that's why they stale intellectual property. And so from a trade perspective, the most pernicious threat is, is clearly China. Uh, Russia likes to cause chaos. Iran likes to target our critical infrastructure. North Korea tries to steal our money. Those are generalizations, but that's kind of the, you know, the, the focus. There are global uh, non-state sponsored uh, cyber criminals who have gotten better. Uh, they're generally in the ransomware space, but you know, Chris actually probably knows this uh, area as, as well as I do. So general, I'd let, I'd let him weigh in on this too. That's a good point. Chris, wh what do you think? Well, uh, you know, the, uh, the adversaries have a purpose. And uh, as articulated by Matt, the, the adversarial perspective is uh, related to, you know, intellectual property theft. Uh, it's related to business interruption. Uh, in some cases, there are integrity-oriented attacks where they're trying to create confusion across your systems, appear, you know, make your systems appear that they're monitoring and functioning properly, but in the back end, they're actually not, and and that has a downstream effect. So. You know, having that adversarial perspective on, on you know, what types of damage they can cause, uh, you know, what's the really the intent and the purpose behind that adversarial perspective, and then you align your security strategy according to those adversarials' intentions, as well as their tooling and the platforms that they'll use in order to execute those attacks effectively. 
and that quite honestly that that helps you gain some additional intelligence and and these uh, adversarial perspectives and tooling and platforms and incentives uh, continue to evolve so you know there are a wide range of threat intelligence uh, service providers that operate in the commercial domain um, there are a number of feeds that can be sourced from through government such as DHS uh, and and really it's a combination of the two and look you know um, know who your local and national DHS officials are know your um, local and national FBI officials are um, they'll be if they're available they're more than happy to you know, come in to participate into an exercise or in, in today's world, they'll jump on a Zoom call and, and provide you with some perspective. And, and so I, I would, you know, continuously encourage that constant communications. Thank you. Mario, I'd like to ask your opinion on this one because you throw up, threw out some pretty pretty weighty statistics on, on how many uh, hits you all had been having. Are, do you have the capability of kind of looking at where those are coming from and seeing uh, uh, your adversaries uh, and, and how prevalent they are with regard to rather being criminal or nation state or uh, domestically uh, or maybe all of it? I think it's a wide spectrum here, uh, General. I think Matt and Chris pretty much covered the, the regions that are high on the radar in terms of participating in this kind of uh, activity. And again, for us here, it's, it's very important that again, uh, we understand what those threats are, uh, particularly in light of the, uh, what the COVID era has brought us. So as an example, if we go back to April of this year, April, 2020, and the popularity of the Zoom technology that everybody was moving to uh, because of the, uh, again, the need to move to a virtual uh, venue type uh, environment. Well, in April 2020, they were already, uh, from uh, our understanding was when it's been reported, 5,000 passwords that were stolen, uh, that is Zoom passwords. And again, those of us, you, we probably all uh, understand that the concerns with regard to virtual technology and the security concerns. Uh, and of course, more specifically, as it relates to Zoom in terms of the statistic I just gave you. So again, it's an enhanced environment that we're in uh, going forward. And I, and I think one thing about COVID that has made it very clear is that uh, uh, all of us, uh, whether you're in a public or private sector, or even in a situation in terms of business or non-business related, this uh, virtual technology and where we're going as we move through the fourth uh, industrial revolution, the importance of us being very vigilant with regard to understanding not only where these attacks are coming from, but in terms of how you invest uh, a high investment in, in terms of a, a firewall that you need to have. Great. Gene, anything you'd like to add? Sure. Of those 44 million cyber intrusion attempts per month, we know where every single one of them comes from. And whether it's a, a potential attack on this port or a small regional airport in rural America, we see it. We've also had, with the great work of our allied agency partners, the ability to design script to monitor chatter on various social media networks and even look a little bit into the dark web and see where some of the folks are trying to talk, scheme, and plan. But those four uh, that were mentioned earlier, true to form here in our top four, as well as Eastern European bloc countries. So watching very closely. And the other area that we've seen uh, quite a bit are the folks who try to trick people uh, by calling over the phone and saying they work for the tax department or social security. And we know very well what the protocols of those federal agencies are. So again, trying to match up training, education, and awareness uh, to combat the guy with a burner phone in Las Vegas seems to do pretty well. Right. And it looks like, Chris, did you have something you wanted to add before I move on to the next question? No, I, I was just going to, just to, just to reinforce this topic, you know, understanding, you know, where your, your core exposures are and, and your critical assets are is, is absolutely critical. And, you know, think about it from an adversarial perspective. They're looking to monetize uh, your, your, your company through some type of form of cyber attack. So if you don't take that internal perspective to try to understand how those cyber assets can be monetized, 
the adversaries already have you figured out. So uh, your best bet is to be, you know, at least in part, if not two or three steps ahead of the adversary. Right. Um, so we're we're uh, getting close to end time here, but we do have another question that I, I think is pertinent uh, for the panel. And it says, are you able to share examples of key global partnerships in this space that have allowed responses, strong responses to cyber threats or shared technology? So Gene, I know you, you talked quite a bit about information sharing, so maybe you could kick that off and, and, I'll, uh, and then Matt, I know that you probably have a perspective as well, so. Yeah, it begins, uh, General, at the local, state, and federal level, and then how we fan out from there, uh, given the international trade platform that we're responsible for today. Uh, so the work, uh, with the exception of those, uh, those folks that have been mentioned throughout this discussion, uh, continues to develop in strength and our like-minded goals. Great. Matt, what, uh, what are you seeing globally? Well, our global partnerships are critical because I said at the onset, this is, uh, you know, it's a collective risk problem that, that transcends borders. And so we obviously work closely, what's called the five eyes, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, but also through other fora like the World Economic Forum, uh, the OEC. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is drive uh, better norms throughout the world. And this is literally of like-minded nations who respect uh, intellectual property rights, that uh, agree you shouldn't target critical infrastructure, that have an independent judiciary, that respect individual privacy. You know, those are traits and values that cyber threat actors don't share. And the more that like-minded nations can reaffirm and reinforce uh, those values, the better off the, this global trade ecosystem will be. Terrific. Uh, Chris or Mario, either one of you have anything to add there on um, strong, uh, partnerships globally and how that enables us to, I like to say a rising tide lifts all boats. So um, how that helps us be better. Sure. I think it, yeah, I, I would been, say, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I all right. So let, I'll take over as moderator. Chris, how about you? <laughs> just, just one, one quick insertion. And uh, Matt mentioned the World Economic Forum. So that brings about uh, like by like-minded companies, industries, and um, you know, nations, in particular at the executive level, to think about how they prioritize risk exposure, cyber being one of the top risks, and how, uh, more importantly, how they coordinate in terms of managing down that exposure on a uh, coordinated fashion. And then uh, through uh, my time with government, certainly working with U.S. Treasury on securing the financial markets, the G7 has a forum that uh, we've uh, used as an opportunity to not only coordinate our understanding of uh, similar types of threats, but we've performed a number of exercises. So having those, uh, those countries and those partners in the ecosystem in, in different parts of the world coordinate through those exercises, I think would be extremely beneficial as you start to develop your muscle. Great, Mario? Has been said, General. I mean, it's it's clear that uh, no matter what industry you're in, uh, everybody is having a conversation with regard to how important it is to collaborate uh, with your industry partners, uh, and particularly also as governmental entities, how important it is to make sure we have a focus with regard to this ever important subject matter. And again, when you look to what the federal government's doing over the past years, particularly Homeland Security and uh, other agencies that uh, again, we all know what's happening in the background in terms of some of the important, not only conversations, but implementation of prevention. You know, some of this we can't talk about publicly, but suffice to say, I think we all know that this is a conversation that's being had. And, and for the private sector and members of the chamber, again, as Gene referenced, I think it's a great opportunity for us to uh, be accessible and partner with regard to this very important item, because it's, it's not just important for uh, industrial uh, or industry excuse me, industry entities such as ours, but the public overall and business overall. So I think again, uh, I look forward to continued collaboration with, with both the public and private sector. And of course, government's going to be very important to assist with the particular with the ongoing funding that we need to continue the state of the art firewall implementation. 
Great, thank you. I think um, I'd like to ask one final question and then uh, we'll turn it back to uh, David and uh, to finish up the, the rest of the session today. But um, maybe Matt, you could speak a little bit to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And um, all there were several recommendations in there. I can't even, I think I've lost count, something like 25 recommendations for our nation um, and for Congress to take action to uh, protect the nation further in cyberspace. Uh, I think one of those recommendations was that your uh, agency be named the lead agency for the for the nation uh, and having worn my former hat, I know that that was probably an interesting discussion that happened among the members in the cyber who made up the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So uh, could you just uh, speak a little bit to that, uh, that commission and um, maybe some of its recommendations if, uh, if you uh, are aware of it? I am, and so yes and no. So just for your viewers, the Cyber Slam Commission, congressionally appointed blue ribbon panel, really kind of equivalent to what the Eisenhower administration did in terms of strategic deterrence. Uh, what's the future of cyber in terms of how the federal government approaches it? I won't speak to any recommendations. Uh, they are still, uh, in terms of the entire executive branch, uh, you know, we are still digesting and iterating with Congress. So I'm not at liberty to kind of comment on any one of those recommendations. But I certainly encourage everyone to, to read the document, the report. They spent a good uh, nearly a year researching a lot of issues in terms of um, capabilities, how to train the cyber workforce up tomorrow, and then mm -hmm. kind of the inside the beltway, uh, who's doing what. Uh, so, But I, I can't comment on any recommendation. Right. I understand. Thank you. I mean, it, I, I would recommend that the audience uh, in your spare time um, think about at least reading the executive summary. It is not that long and it does a, provide an interesting perspective on um, what this commission came up with and some of the recommendations that it has from a national perspective. I don't uh, really have anything else. Um, let me just uh, go around to the panel members and see if you just have like one more closing uh, comment you'd like to make. So uh, Mario, how about you? Any any closing comments? I think the, my closing comment that it's very important at the federal level to continue with the mindset that I think uh, we've seen this uh, over the past years on the leadership on cybersecurity. I think it's gonna be a continued dynamic for uh, government to work not only with the uh, port authorities from a port perspective, but from the business sector for the proper funding that we need in this very important area, because it's a very, very expensive investment, a necessary investment. So I, I'm very pleased that uh, at the federal level, we, we have that cognizant uh, thought in terms of how important it is to fund uh, the cybersecurity component uh, for businesses. Thank you. Uh, Chris, how about you? Any closing comments? Yeah, just <clears throat> just one comment on the Solarium Commission report. And I realize the the recommendations are still going through the vetting process. Uh, one you know takeaway that certainly resonates with me and the community that I work in, particularly across you know the board, uh, the CFO and the CRO community, is taking you know kind of a threat and risk based approach to applying the appropriate defenses across the enterprise. And that requires you know, continuous monitoring of not only where your risk exposures are within the four walls of your company and your organization, but also pairing that with an adversarial perspective and then pairing the two in order to drive at what types of investment decisions should I make, what types of process improvements should be calibrated and more importantly, how is that whole process governed at the board level downstream to management? So, you know, without that top down support, um, you're, you're not going to have a, a proper foundation. And I've seen many companies fail, many organizations fail without that top down support. Thank you so much. Um, Jean, what are your thoughts? Any closing comments? 
Sure. Thanks, General. Uh, for the members and the viewers today, please know that cybersecurity is woven throughout our strategic plan here at the Port of Los Angeles and aligned directly with our head of public safety. It's an always learning philosophy that understands the risk terrain and what we need to do to fight off those folks that want to take advantage of us. But the culture that's been developed as demonstrated with the infrastructure of the Cybersecurity Operations Center, the Cyber Resilience Center, and the training and effect of those professionals that go to work every day here to protect the interests of this port, whether it be the information flow, the physical goods that move through, or many of our members that do business right here at our port complex, your interests are front and center every day. Great. And Matt? Closing comments? Yeah, I want to thank Mario and Gene for being here and Mary for your comments. I mean, when you think about, you know, we think about Homeland Security, economic security is a big part of that whole construct and, and, and the ports represent a big part of this nation's economic security. So uh, it's just vital uh, when we consider national critical functions that the ports are certainly in there. And in terms of uh, final thoughts, I'll just I'll recite the SISA motto, which is defend today, secure tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There are present day real time threats that as, as Gene said, are hitting us every day. We've got to defend against those. We've got to work together, but there's also the long game we got to play, securing tomorrow. Those investments we make, whether it's 5G, whether it's better understanding the risk in our supply chain, training our workforce to tomorrow, those are the things we got to do to secure tomorrow. So I appreciate all the viewers. I appreciate General you moderating today. Thank you. Great, well, thanks again to all the panels. I guess I'd like to leave a final thought that I might have. Um, Chris Inglis, I had the opportunity to, to work with him at, uh, he was the executive deputy director at uh, NSA, and he has mentioned that it, you could reduce your risk exposure by about 40% or by 80% if you did four things really well. And those four things is institute multi-factor authentication across your network, um, to uh, have good access and privileged access controls in place, to uh, do appropriate network segmentation and identify your critical data and uh, segment your network appropriately, and do one thing really well, which is, sounds easy, but it's really hard, and that's great vulnerability management and that patching. So um, I think I'd like to leave the, leave the group with, with those thoughts for me and um, turn it back over to David and uh, to get going with the program. Thank you all to the panel members. It was a pleasure uh, being uh, the moderator with you today. Fantastic. Great job, General, moderating and to our panelists. It was a wonderful conversation and a scary thought, our security, but knowing that you all are at the helm and leading the way makes us feel a lot safer. So uh, we really appreciate that conversation. Uh, now we are pleased to feature a very special message to us from Geneva, Switzerland, from the renowned World Economic Forum. The forum is an internationally distinguished community of leaders from business politics, arts, the media, and with a mission to improve the state of the world by engaging leaders from various areas to shape global, regional, and industrial agendas. They are a valued partner to the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, and we couldn't have a more timely message today from a more distinguished individual, president of the World Economic Forum and former foreign minister of Norway, we are pleased to hear from Mr. Borga Rinde. Thank you for this opportunity to address the World Trade Week Southern California Conference. It's an honor. This dialogue couldn't have come at a more pivotal time. We are witnessing a global pandemic, economic uncertainty, geopolitical instability, and climate change. And we also have the wildfires now in California, terrible, uh, all my sympathies. Alone, any one of these would define our era. Together, they demand we reset our future. They demand we move away from individual, isolated action toward comprehensive, collective efforts. Re-energizing trade 
is a fundamental part of this. Less than a year ago, global economic growth was projected at more than 3%. No, the global economy is expected to contract with more than 5%. The August WTO goods trade barometer points to a 20% decline in trade for the second quarter of this year. Foreign investment is expected to be down further. We can expect a 30% drop. That's significant. The pressure on trade derive, of course, from the shock of the COVID-19, a global pandemic like nothing we have seen in our lifetimes. That's what we're talking about. But the pressure also come from long simmering structural changes in the global economy, driven by new technologies, business models, and shifts in power. So there is no business as usual, not in the future either. And we're also seeing changes from an evolving supply chain that is placing greater emphasis on flexibility, circularity, and physical proximity. In reaction to the pandemic, the world is in a synchronized way launched 11 trillion US dollars in fiscal stimulus. This is unparalleled. These whatever it takes measures have been crucial in staving off the very worst. That's for sure. If you look at the markets, it feels like the best of times. But let's face it, the global economy seems to be losing steam early in the recovery. The fact is, we can't rely on stimulus financed by increasing debt alone. For a sustained recovery, we need to leverage the collective strength of our economies. Global value chains powered an economic revolution over the past three decades. Growth accelerated, income rose, rise, poverty rates plunged. Today, almost 50% of global trade involves global value chains. It's incredible. But in May, The Economist magazine ran the title Goodbye globalization, overblown perhaps, but highlighting that at the very least, trade and investment face significant uncertainty. To re-energize trade, we need to reset it. Here I would like to suggest three priorities. Trade and investment facilitation, clear rules for digital and improved environmental outcomes. On facilitation, we are seeing governments around the world streamline trade processes and these efforts should be accelerated. The World Economic Forum leads the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, a public-private partnership that is helping governments in over a dozen countries implementing the World Trade Organization's Trade Facilitation Agreement. Making trade easier, that is really what it is about. This work is showing how improvements in border processing can lead to millions in savings. On digital trade, domestic e-commerce is growing very, very fast. But yet there is room to improve consumer protection regulations and digital payment systems in order to expand cross-border activity. And while trade in IT-related services has grown by 11% annually on average over the last decade, we need to find a way to avoid undue barriers and fragmentation on data governance. This means tech shareholders and stakeholders here in California and around the world should come together on topics such as privacy, competition, and digital taxation. When it comes to the environment, trade is often viewed with skepticism despite enormous contributions it can make to efficiency and the spread of innovation. The US has uh, worked with countries in the Asia Pacific, for example, to cut tariffs on environmentally friendly goods, boosting trade worth of over 300 billion US dollars that can help improve environmental stewardship. This is amazing. Still, given the importance of addressing our climate crisis, an issue California has shown great leadership on, 
Trade needs to contribute more to fostering a circular global economy and incentivizing environmental performance. We only have one planet, not the planet B, even if we're acting as there is a planet B. Recommitting to trade is difficult amid today's headwinds. In worrying times, societies pull up the drawbridge. There is a belief that reshoring is synonymous with resilience. But so much of our resilience comes from our diversity and adaptability. We must be careful not to lock ourselves off from the world. I'm confident that in working together, the public and the private sector can put in place measures that facilitate more efficient trade, remove digital barriers, meet our commitment to the environment, and foster inclusive growth. Advanced together, these priorities can deliver greater value to stakeholders across industries and societies. In doing so, they can help unlock a more prosperous future. This is really what it's all about. We have to continue to trade. We have to continue to follow our comparative advantages. But we have to create a more sustainable planet at the same time with more inclusive, more job-creating growth. And trade is part of that solution. And we can't forget that when we have a trade discussion. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Mr. Brende, well said. I'd like to bring Maria Salinas back to provide a closing message for all of you. But before I do, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, our speakers, and our attendees that made today possible. And thank you for having me today. It was an honor to be your host this morning, and this is one of my favorite events of the year, and it's so well run. Thank you, everybody, for taking part in this. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Maria Salinas back to close out the 94th annual World Trade Week virtual conference. Maria. This was an exciting event today. We were able to hear from so many leaders in the industry. We greatly appreciate your dedication, innovations, and resilience. At the Chamber, we are fortunate to have events and speakers of this caliber throughout the year, and I encourage you to join us. I would once again like to thank all of you for attending our virtual World Trade Week event. I also would like to thank our sponsors, the World Trade Week Committee, for their support and dedication to the industry. Please mark your calendars for next year's event on May 7, 2021. And I look forward to when we can meet again in person. Until then, please stay and virtually network with each other. Thank you again for attending today's program.
Goes down.